in this exercise, um, we're going to stabilize this handheld shot of this uh, nesting box attached to this uh, to this tree. Uh, you can see the, uh, the that I've already read this node in and uh, connected it to the viewer, and it's playing now in the screen. You can see that it's quite unstable; it's moving about quite a, quite quite a lot. Um, there's always a few challenges with shots of this type. Um, the obvious one is that it's handheld shot. All handheld shots are by nature unstable, uh, which results in the image moving not only in position values, the x and y position values, but also in rotation and possibly scale. If you bear in mind, for example, that the, you know that the, uh, the the operator may may lurch slightly forwards or, or backwards, uh, resulting in a relative scale of the image that they're that they're viewing through the uh, through the through the camera. Uh, so that's one of the main issues with this particular shot. Uh, the other is that it's a standard definition image. It's fairly soft in focus. It's also got some moderate motion blur w within it, um, and um, and so that th those issues, soft focus and motion blur, often make it quite difficult to find sharp areas of contrast within the image that stay intact throughout the duration of the shot. Um, and the other element is that there's a little bit of motion within the shot, particularly the sort of the, the, the fine the fine branches and the leaves on those fine, fine branches are moving around. And we've got to be careful of those that they don't unsettle uh, the track uh, at some point during the course of its play. Okay, so let's just stop this now and we'll take a look at how we can stabilize it. Okay, so the, the obvious thing is that we need to read our image in. I've already done that, uh, and so the reason why I was able to play it uh, during that initial introduction. Um, so that's the first thing that we do. The second thing that we need to do is we need to apply a tracker node. So if we hit the tab button and we start to type, eventually that will come up and we can select it, and that is now applied. The tracker node always goes directly below our uh, our image that we're using to target as the target for the track and again initially nothing happens um, and the reason for that is that we have to apply the feature tracks to the uh, to, to the actual uh, node itself so we'll start by adding a track we're actually going to add two in this particular case again when you add the track you see the uh, you see the track box in the image and you also see the preview which is essentially what is being shown within that pattern area or feature region. The first thing that we have to do is we have to find a suitable area so always when we track we play the we ping pong the shot backwards and forwards and we watch it several times and we're looking for the issues that I was talking about a few minutes ago. Uh, so in this particular case Let's see if we can create a track that doesn't work particularly well. So I'm just going to come over here and I'm just going to go for somewhere around about that, around this corner. And we'll just see what happens when we track in that area. So I've, I've pinpointed the center of my track to that area. Um, again, I can scale down the pattern area so it refines the area that it's looking for. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave it up. And then this box determines whether the extent to which that pattern will be available in the next frame. So obviously if it's moving about a lot, this then this uh, search area needs to be much bigger. If the movement's fairly sedentary, then it can be much smaller. I think we'll get away with pretty much the, uh, the default box in this particular case. So so I have my tracker in the in the in the scene. If I just if I just pull this across, we can see that we're just tracking on trans on the translations on this particular one. Even though we kind of anticipate that there is going to be some uh, rotation and possibly some scale movement in this as well, we're going to actually add a second tracker uh, to this and uh, perform what we call a two-point track, where we use two uh, where we use two track points that are interrelated in order to um, in order to solve a problem around rotation and scale in a track. Okay, so we've got this, so let's start by setting it going. So this is the track forward button, and as always, as we track forward, we want to be watching the preview area to, to check for the quality of the track. So as we were doing that, I was noticing that it uh, that it was deviating quite a bit. Uh, you, you notice at the first frame, for example, that it's tighter into that corner 
uh, but towards the end of the shot it's actually moved quite a bit across and it's also jittering quite a bit it's, it's jumping around a little bit you know you can see here, for example that it's higher up it should be much lower down so this is actually not a particularly good track and the reason for that essentially is that there's just too much change in the pixel values going on within this place uh, there's uh, you know there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of motion blur which is uh, which is causing look I mean look at the pattern of pixels in that particular frame for example they bear no, bear no resemblance to the pixels here so the pattern's changing too much and as a result of that the track is getting confused it can't pinpoint where it should be so this is actually not a particularly good place to track so we'll just move to the first frame and hit the clear forwards button which gets rid of all the keyframes so I'm going to choose a different location I'm actually going to choose this um, Oops, just drop that. I'm just going to choose this uh, this entrance area to the uh, to the bird box itself, and I'm going to scale up so that it's pretty much covering the the entire the entire area of the of the entrance to that. So somewhere somewhere around about there looks okay, uh, and I'll just widen out the search box commensurately. So we'll just take a look at this. I'll just tidy that in a little bit. So it's not uh, so there's not too much surplus around on the on on the on the bottom and top of the hole. So we'll try this again. We're on the first frame. So again, we'll track forwards. And again, we want to be watching this. We want to be making sure that this that this this circle area, this 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 hole, sort of stays pretty much sort of stable within that bounding box. And we can already see that this is much much more stable. A much more a much more stable track so again if we scrub this we can see there's very little deviation uh, of that uh, of that of that image around that uh, ar around that hole that entrance hole there so that's looking like a pretty good track so we need to th add a second track now uh, to deal with the uh, with the rotation and scale properties which we kind of anticipate will be present within this image so I'll just come out a little bit so we can see the, the image wi wider up. And again, we're looking for a second area to track. Uh, in this particular case, I'll be looking somewhere down the bottom of the uh, uh, of the image. This is looking like a potential a potential there. If I just scrub through just to look at it, it may be subject to a bit of motion blur. There's also a possibility of using this corner. This corner is certainly out of commission because there's leaves moving around in front of it. Um, so we'll try this. We'll try this central area. So I'm just going to come into this, and I'm going to add another track. Before I actually move on, I'm just going to turn off my track one, um, and the reason why I'm doing that is I don't want to inadvertently retrack it while I'm uh, while I'm working on track two. So I'm back onto track two now, and I'm just going to bring this down and position it over this area, and I'm just going for that highest point of contrast. That, that that contrast, if we look at that, is likely to change quite a bit over the course of the shot. Um, but if we can kind of pinpoint this down to this area, it, we may it may work out for us. So the next thing that we need to do is we need to enable some additional properties. At the moment, the second track's got no properties enabled, and we need to enable all three properties on this. So we need to to pick up the transform the translation data so that it can base its translation data on track one and work out the difference and we also need to uh, to enable rotation and scale so once we've done that we can track forward so again we're going to be watching this uh, this preview pane just to make sure that it stays central to that inner box and we can see that even though there's quite a bit of pixel change going on within that uh, Within within that box, the box is is key is keeping pretty central to that box, so it looks again like we've got the basis of a good track there. So the last thing we have to do is define what we want this track to be to do, and to be used for. So I'm going to come into my transform tab, and in the transform drop down, 
I'm going to choose stabilize. You can see there's a stabilize one point option there which you can use to stabilize if you don't if the if you don't feel there is any rotation or scale in the shot, then uh, then you could stabilize it with that. In this particular case, I'm going to choose the stabilize option by itself which is going to allow it to accept the uh, both both of the trackers. And if we just um just hover over the um, over the viewing area and, uh, and and centralize it, and we just play this now. We can see the challenge with uh, with with stabilizing data. Essentially, when we chose stabilize, that's it. It's stabilized, um, but we can see the consequence of stabilization. Essentially, what happens with stabilization is that uh, in this particular case, Nuke will animate the image in the exact opposite direction as what's being implemented by the tracking data. So the tracking data has established um, a, a center point for itself and whichever direction that moves nukes transforming the image in the exact opposite direction. So essentially you get this effect where the where the bird box is now centered in the image and is pretty stable but the image is moving within the bounding box and what that's doing is that's that's actually act, uh, it's revealing areas within the bounding box that are not populated by image information. So if we were to write this out now we would have an uh, we would have a black border around the bottom and the and the left side on this particular frame. And of course that is moving around. So that box will that that black area will change as it goes through the frame. And this is the consequence of stabilizing the real trick to stabilizing is doing it in the pr in principal photography and getting the shot as stable as you possibly can. You can you can do a lot in post production, but ultimately, uh, but the price that we've paid here for stabilizing this image is that we've got areas of the bounding box that are unpopulated and we have to populate them. And to do that, we essentially have to scale the image up, and this is the consequence because. Uh, because the more we scale up the image, the softer the image will go and eventually the image will pixelate. So if we've got this image moving around in a crazy kind of way, then uh, then obviously we have to scale it up more and the consequence of that is a softer image. So let's look at what we can do with this. I'm just going to try and bring this... I'll just bring these together a little bit so that I can, uh, so I can reduce the size of the node graph. So what we need to do is we need to add a transform node and we're going to use this to scale the image up. So I'm just going to take this and I'm just going to scale it up and we want to be scaling it up as little as we possibly can. We're just looking at the bounding box and making sure that our image, that there's image information constantly within the bounding box at every frame. So if we come for example forward in time to say I've actually moved my I've actually moved my in and out point there accidentally. We go back to the image input. So if we come to say this area, we're pretty tight on the on, on the top left there. Um, we could possibly get away with it being maybe scaled a little bit less than that. Remember that we're trying to scale this as little as we possibly can. You see, we're very tight to the bound boundary on the top there. Uh, I'm also looking at the bottom to make sure that we don't come close at the bottom. So that's looking okay. We've managed to scale it up just by 0.8, which isn't necessarily too bad. But obviously, we wouldn't. You, it's better not to scale it up at all. Now there are situations where. Uh, the, tr the the stabilize causes the image to sort of lurch in one particular direction, say to the right. Uh, this this it isn't the case in this particular case. The uh, the the translation is pretty uniform, so we've had to scale it up by this much. But if the if if the image image kind of lurches to the right, one thing you can do is add a second transform node and reposition the image so it's more central within the um, w within the within the bounding box after the stabilization has taken place and that's going to reduce the amount that we have to scale up so that's always a consideration that you might want to take anyway we now have a stabilized image which is um, which is fully populating our uh, our bounding box and that is the end of the exercise I hope you found it useful